listening to another powerful message from C3 Southwest Washington. We are so excited you're here with us, and we believe God has more in store for you. Who is excited to be here today? Welcome to our grand opening. Up until this point, we have been trying to dial the building in and try to figure out how to turn the lights on and a few other things, and we have finally hit that spot, and we are so grateful for the opportunity to not only be a part of our community, but to influence our community with a message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Come on, let me, let me hear it if you agree with that. And in the process of that, I want to just take a, a moment, and I want to pray and give God thanks for those of you who are... Uh, locked in as church family, you know the work that it's taken to get to this spot, and almost everyone in our church family has played key roles. There's no way I could go and say thank you to individuals uh, leading up to this day because we would be, I would use up all my time just naming people. I'd probably miss somebody, they'd be upset, and then we'd have an altercation in the parking lot afterward, you know, it's all that thing. <laughs> so I want to avoid that, and I just want to express to our church family, thank you and I want to say thank you to friends and family who are becoming a part of our church family. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for helping us to celebrate not only a building, but what happens inside of the building. You know, buildings are just containers for life to happen. Your house is not a home without the people inside, and it's not really a home unless what's going on inside is life-giving. And so we recognize the privilege of a facility because we have met in schools, and we have met in houses, and we have met a little bit online, and we have met in garages, and we have met in tents that we're blowing over, which is everybody's favorite except for mine. I am a big fan of having to be able to control the environment, control the heating and cooling, and to be able to, to do what family does without distraction. And ultimately, what we do as family, what makes a church a church, is the fact that we have individually had encounters with the God of the universe. He has shown us that he is real. He has invited us into the story of our lives. And as we come together and as we gather, we celebrate one another as family, but ultimately we celebrate the father of our family, our God in heaven, and who he is and what he's done, amen? That's why we gather. And there's this great confidence that as we gather and as we sing about him and as we sing to him, as we share his word, as his truth goes out, that there is this supernatural draw that happens. I know for me as an 18-year-old, I ended up in church, for a real church, for the very first time when I was invited to a family dinner of someone I did not know, but they had two daughters, so I was all about going to, yes, sir, I'd love to have dinner at your house. And afterwards, when they brought up the idea of church, which is odd to me because it was a Monday night, there was a thing going on called a youth revival. I had no idea what that was. I went to a church, but it was dead. I don't know how to describe it. What was happening inside the box had nothing to do with life on a spiritual level, right? So when I stepped into this church, excited to go with these two daughters and whoever her family was that fed me that night, I walked in. And in that box, in that room, because there were people gathered who had had an actual encounter with God, who were actually walking with God. Imperfect though it may be, they were taking steps in their life, allowing God to lead them with the hopes of not only experiencing the best life possible, but believing that God would use their life to draw someone else into their best life possible. And in those moments, while standing there were crazy people like you guys, singing and clapping, clapping your hands in church. Any church service I had been to prior to that, people singing looked depressed. It was like a funeral dirge that they sung. We had this great big organ at the church I went to, great big pipes, and the woman who played it had such an intense, painful, um, backed up, digestive tract look on her face <laughs> that, that it, it, was, it was excruciating to watch. There was no joy in it. There was no life. No one sang along. And so stepping into a group like this where people actually had an encounter with God was so, so odd, and yet it made so much sense. The people who would sing about God would sing about him as if he were a good thing. No constipation, just joy and excitement and people off tune and people on tune and all sorts of things. And there somehow in the midst of all of that, at that point in my life, it was like a scroll had opened up, like a, like a curtain in, that separated heaven from earth opened enough for me to sense God's presence for the very first time in my life. It wasn't necessarily in what was being said or what was being done. It was now, I understand, the Holy Spirit of God breathing 
on, my, on the soul of who I am that was actually the spirit of who I am, which was actually spiritually dead. I mean, I said I believed in God, but I didn't have an experience with God. And as his wind began to blow across my spirit, it was like there was the furled up sail inside that began to catch that was there for that purpose, that began to catch the very presence of God for the first time in my life. And man, that first time was all it took for me. I said, yes, I leaned forward. I ran up to the altar afterwards. And that happened in a box like this. And so we celebrate that we have a building we celebrate that we're able to open it up so that we as believers can gather and experience together and experience the supernatural and experience the goodness of our God and his presence. But we also gather because of the empty seat that might be next to you, believing that God will use us to fill it with some kid who's going to come because we have a daughter, but they're going to get something different than what they're looking for. They're going to have an encounter with a living God that will change and shape their life for the better, can I have an amen and amen? So I want you to do me a favor. I want you to stand with me, and we're just going to pray a prayer of dedication over this building, and we are honored that you're here to be a part of that. And if there are uh, uh, empty chairs somewheres near you, and trust me, if there's not, we've got more chairs in the back. I'll bring them in here. We'll, stack, we'll hang them off walls, okay? We, we will, we'll rent the property next door. We'll do whatever we can to fill the next chair. But we're going to give God thanks for this building but we're going to dedicate ourselves to building his church, which means inviting people to come in and experience the one true, the living God who loves us, who sent his son for us so that we could step into not just survival life, but step into abundant life. Amen? And pass that on to other people. So pray with me. I'm not, I, we don't, I don't see any place in the Bible where i got to close my eyes to pray. So if it's creepy to you, I'm going to look you in the eye and you look me in the eye and we're going to do this in agreement together. Father, we thank you for this building. God, we celebrate all that it took, what you did so that we could have a place, a box to have family in. We're grateful that we're no longer meeting here and there. There's no tents blowing over in this place. God, we celebrate the past, but we thank you for this moment. We dedicate what used to be a pawn shop, a place that used to take people's treasure and hand them pennies. And Lord, we celebrate that we walk into this place with not much to offer, and you replace it with the best that heaven has to offer. It's the reverse, the redemption of a space. God, we pray for the other build, the building owner. Bless him for opening the door so that we could be a part of this place. Uh, Father, we pray that every time we gather, the most important thing that happens is that you're here in the midst and that people experience you. We dedicate this space not only to you and your people, but especially to the people who will become your people in this place. Come on. In this place, Lord, we're believing for that. And so we dedicate this spot, space, and the future to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. Give the Lord a big hand. And you can be seated. It's awesome. I want to make that quick but sincere uh, because we have a, a couple things to cover. A couple of just things that I want to really emphasize coming up. We've got a couple of events. There's something beginning on Tuesday called November Fast. This is just a quick plug. But later today, this evening, will be our, our video zero. It's the introduction to November fast. A lot of churches, and this is fine, they, on January 1st, they begin to pray for their new year. And I don't know about you, but I saw like 2019 once I stepped into it, and I was like, oh, oh I should have prepared for this, or, or 2020. I wish I had prepared for this. And so ever since that took place, we decided to start taking a couple months in advance to prepare for the coming year. So that nothing takes us by surprise. So every November now, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. I won't go into a lot of detail, but go online, register. You can use a QR code to get there. There's a book to download. Every day there will be a new video on our church Facebook page. It'll give you some instruction, some direction, and there's some disciplines to engage in for the next 21 days. Because the scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God and I will what? I'll do all these things on your behalf. I will, in other words... I don't know what 2023 has, but if I set myself up in partnership with God for the new year, guess what? He's going to carry me through, and it's going to be better than if I tried to navigate myself. Amen? And so we want to get you involved with that, and that will be rolling out tonight. Uh, website's already up for that, but we'll roll out the videos starting tonight. Uh, next event that I really want to draw you guys' attention to is our Superman Saturday. Not Superman Saturday. We celebrate the Superman who is Jesus, but we are becoming Supermen. Guys, that's us. 
And uh, we want you to register. we got a special day. Pastor Drew Davies will be here that morning. It's actually a Saturday. I know the announcement said Sunday. That's my bad. Saturday at, uh, I believe it's at 1030 a.m., Pastor Drew will be here. Pastor Kerry will be with us from Frisco, Texas. It'll be a dude day that morning. Uh, we're going to have a great time. And if you notice the little axe symbol, we'll also be opening registration that night for our axe annual axe throwing competition because we're men. And what could go wrong there? Ladies have, uh, have the emergency room on speed dial, but we will compete for Axe Man of the Century uh, for this year. And <laughs> said, if I win, it's going to be for the century. If you win, it's for the year. Okay, so anyway, so guys, get registered for that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I want to welcome you to uh, this special day is what we call a My Story Sunday. And there's this incredible verse that I can barely read because I've made the slide there too small, but you can see it behind me. It's the end of the book of John. And at the end of this account of Jesus, and how many of you know, there's so many amazing, if you've read the book of John or Matthew, Mark, or Luke, there are so many incredible stories within the story of Jesus. People that he meets, places he goes, things that he does. People that, that are so unexpecting to encounter him. They were just trying to date a girl. And they met the king of all kings. And other people who were just, their lives were blown up. And they thought there was no hope, and Jesus meets them and steps into the story of their life. And there are other people who, they're so successful, and yet there's a, still something missing, and they know it. And Jesus steps into their life, and he meets all people in all scenarios and introduces himself as the loving God who's come to sacrifice himself for them so that they can step into the better version of the story of their life. And in the process the story plays out. And there's so many of those in the Bible that we get to the spot at the end of the book of John, at chapter 21, that la those last verses where it says, ultimately, there's so many other things that Jesus did, but if we were to put them all in a book, there would not be, there's, there'd be too many books, not enough books to actually contain all of the stories. And the reason why that is so biblically true is because in this room alone, not knowing how many people are in this room, there are individual stories that are currently in process. The chapters of the book of your life are adding up. And since the first chapter started, the prelogue, as you were being developed in your mother's womb, the, the, the book began. In the subtext for the entire story of your life, as it's being written by the hand of God, is God's desire to step into your life to show you his love and his plan and the better way to navigate this insane world that we're living on in right now. Amen? And so many times through our lives, there's this moment where the Lord is trying to step in to reveal himself to us. And when I look back on my life, though, it was 18 years old in 1985, and I've given my age up. Some, some of you thought I was 29 or 30. I know it's confusing and all that. However, um, when I he stepped into my life at 18, what I now know is there were so many other moments that he was trying to step into my life, but I had so much going on, and I was so distracted, and I had the volume up so high because of what I was experiencing in life that it took me until I was 18. But I love, I love that he stepped into my life, and the story of our partnership and really me following him began. And being involved with a church, I get to experience so many people through my lifetime who sometimes come into the room in process, in story, mid-story, and we get to add to the story and see the story uh, be accelerated and improve and get better, and there's some challenging moments, and we walk through those together. But I especially love when people come into the room, and in some cases, not only are they here under a little bit of duress, but they're also here because somebody has made them come here. Anybody. You don't have to raise your hands. But what I love about that moment is regardless of why people end up in the room, I know that God seizes the moment. And I'll never forget the, my story that we have today, both Shane and Kim Christensen, their story together. I'll never forget my first introduction with them and my first dialogue with Shane, and he made something clear. He said, I am here for my family. I'm not so sure all about this other stuff. And I, I bellied up to the side of him and tried to throw a little bit of shade intimidation his way. And after his trembling subsided, I let, I, I let him know. I said, well, that's fine, but I'm going to tell you something. You're in my world now. Not just in my world, but you're in 
our world now. And not just our world, but you're in his world now. And what I'm confident is that you step into the spaces where God is, and he'll show you who you are. And then you won't be just going because of duress or because you're wanting to honor someone. You'll be going because you've met the king of all kings. At this time, I'd like to present to you Shane and Kim's My Story. Give a round of applause, and I'll step down. My name is Shane Christensen. And my name is Kim Christensen. And, and this, this is, is our story. story. I was born in Madison, Wisconsin. But when I was eight years old, my mom moved us to Southern California where pretty much ran the streets with my brother unsupervised. I grew up in a little town in Northern Idaho where I lived with my mom and my two older sisters. When I was really young, uh, we went to Sunday school at a Catholic church, but other than my first communion, I don't remember much. And after we moved to California, I stopped going to the church altogether. Uh, God back then really didn't factor into my life at all. I grew up in a Nazarene church with a strong faith. I was baptized at seven or eight years old. We were usually at church at least four nights a week. It was a safe place for me, especially since my home was not safe at all. A family member gave me my first beer when I was like nine years old at a wedding. By 12 or 13, I was smoking pot and drinking, which led to pretty much any other drug I could get my hands on. Um, I didn't drink because I like the taste. I drank to get as intoxicated as possible to escape reality in my childhood trauma. Um, I became the life of the party, but no one knew that I was actually dying inside. In seventh grade, our church choir went on a tour for a couple weeks during the summer. We traveled on a chartered bus, and we sang in different churches every night. Those trips were some of my very fondest memories. In my early 20s, I left California for the big city lights of Miami. My partying went from bad to worse. Um, I ended up bartending and living for myself and what I wanted. I got married and then I got separated. Uh, I finally needed a change of scenery. So five years ago, I moved to Vancouver to help open a gym. I went from living the life in Miami's fast lane to living at five miles an hour Vancouver style. I got up every morning at 4 a.m. to open the gym. When back in Miami, I would have been just getting home from the bar partying. When I was 16, my mom was diagnosed with bone cancer and she passed away when I was 19. That same year, I got pregnant with my daughter, Katie, and while all my friends were partying, I was working and trying to learn how to be a mom. I kept trying to get back into church, but the loss of my mom made it all too painful. I eventually got married and had my second daughter, Raina. I started attending church again, and while I had several incredible experiences with the Lord during that time, my marriage was struggling. When I realized that we were going to end up divorced, I left church to avoid the embarrassment. I met Kim the first day that we opened the gym. Uh, immediately put a target on her because she was the most beautiful woman that I ever laid eyes on. Of course, she ignored me for the first two months, which made me try even harder. Uh, once we started dating, we were inseparable, but I had no intention of going to church with her. I met 
Shane right after my divorce and thought it was the worst time in the world to meet someone. Right away, I was attracted to his energy and how great he is with people. Everyone loved him. He was confident and outgoing and all the things I am not. And because he was raised by a single mom, he was very, very protective of me and my kids. Once we started dating, that was it. but I still wasn't a part of a church family. And then COVID hit. Between remote school, working from home, and the gym being closed, and all of the negative input from mainstream media, things were very tough. I could feel the war raging within me, and I started questioning what I believed, what I stood for, and even how to be a mom. That was a scary moment, and I knew my daughter and I needed to reconnect with church. When Kim brought up the idea of going to church, I really wasn't too thrilled, but I was also ready to do whatever it took to get our family healthy again. Tried out a couple churches near our house, and then we tried C3, which was meeting in the converted garage studio. When I first walked into that garage, I knew there was no way I was coming back for a second visit. Pastor Steve uh, delivered the message, and I was intrigued, and I agreed to go back. Everyone was so friendly and genuine. Shane heard Pastor Steve talking about riding side-by-sides in the wood and, and shooting guns. I think he was surprised and excited to find out that Christians are regular people too. And for me, after two services at C3, I felt like I was back. I felt permission to be a mom again. I was reminded that God had not changed. I was reminded of who I am and where I stand. I was just going to church to support my family but I was going through the motions. And then something began to shift inside of me. I was intrigued with these people, who they were and all the great things happening in their life. I decided to ask Pastor Steve to help me learn more about Jesus. He handed me a book called Following Jesus and we started meeting together every week to go through a book. Uh, in a few weeks, I was sitting in my living room with my wife, Steve and Rowena, and that's when I said yes to following Jesus. Watching Shane say yes to Jesus was the coolest experience. I never thought that would happen and certainly was not expecting it that night. I'm still trying to figure out how to be a Christian every day, but I'll tell you this. Since I said yes, every aspect of my life is elevated. Kim and I got married, we launched our own gym, we are much closer, and we have a lot more friends, good friends. We are blessed all around. Since we've been a part of the C3 family, I've been so challenged and I am growing. I love the time we spend with our church family. We love volunteering and learning and worshiping together. I feel God is truly healing my scars. I'm learning to navigate through life without fear. I'm learning my home is now a safe place. I'm learning to overcome my anxiety. I can hear the voice of God. I feel his guidance and I know that I'm not alone. Being a part of C3 has brought our family closer and has made our lives better. I was tired of living my life just for me. I'm learning to serve others. I enjoy going to church and I look forward to hearing the message every week. And I find that I'm using the things that I learned to lean into a relationship with God. In fact, I'm excited to get baptized as my next step in my chapter with God. It's been almost 40 years since I was first baptized, but I'm looking forward to getting baptized with my husband and to that outward symbol of recommitting my life to God. I'm Kim Christensen. And I'm Shane Christensen. And, and this, this is, is our story. story. How good was that? I especially want to thank Shane and Kim and Raina for allowing us to go into their home and share their story. 
it's a very vulnerable feeling to tell the truth about some of the things that you've been through. And yet, that is one of the things that's so attractive to all of us about, about the experience with Jesus. It's real people with real lives who are having real experiences and trying to navigate through life, and then we meet him, and then there's this change, but everything isn't made right. There's a process of following Jesus that carries us through our growth and carries us into maturity as we learn who he is, as we learn what he wants to do in our lives. And so I want to say thank you to you guys, pay my respect and my honor to you guys. Um, thank you, Shane. And I can, I can say this, that um, Kim said something that I don't want to correct, but I want to explain to you my confidence in how I see it. While she never expected to see that happen, for him to make a decision for Christ in her life, I had nothing but expectation. And this is why, because I'm of the firm belief if you have one taste, just one little, one little, one little taste, you will be moved for your lifetime. That you, when you taste and see and how good the Lord is, God's so com- I'm so confident in who God is, if you just get a whiff of his fragrance and imagine that fragrance being a part of your life, I, I, you can't say no. I'm confident that you won't be able to say no. So it's really about making sure that we worship God, making sure that he's present, and then just standing back and say, okay, try to resist that one, dude. <laughs> and uh, what a great honor. And I want to say to the Christian sin, to their, to their family and extended family, because they have a large extended family in the gym and in real estate, their family, they've become us. They've become our family. Their families have become our family. Can't imagine our lives without them. And so we celebrate you guys today and the story of God at work in your life. Amen. Uh, a couple thoughts as we kind of wrap things up and before we sing a final song. Uh, I've already said this, but you, you sitting here today, you're already experiencing your story. You're somewhere in between the beginning and the end, and I don't know how long of a book it will be. And I don't know all the details that will happen, but lives are filled with all sorts of things. But you definitely are in the middle of the story. And understand that that story is being recorded from the viewpoint of heaven. And the author has an agenda for your life, and he's built you in a way to desire the agenda that he has But in the world that we live in, everything in this world is fighting against you experiencing what God has for you. It's just the, it's the, it's how the balances are tipped in the world that we live in. And I would say that in this day and age, as we're living, the balances are tipped even a little higher. The voices are a little louder. The world is a little bit more crazy to try to keep you from experiencing the things that God has for you. The truth that will actually help you to navigate through in a, in a uh, path of least resistance in the sense of you won't be getting in your own way, banging into the roadblocks, but you'll navigate as you follow him. Now, your story, like my story, and what I love about Shane and Kim's story is that it is a story that includes real life, which has some injuries and limps. It's not squeaky clean. We haven't tried to sanitize it. The reason why we haven't, and we we don't sanitize stories here in our church family, because God did not see the need to sanitize any of the stories in the Bible. You read about a lot of imperfect people who encountered the perfect God, who then in process began to perfect their lives. But even in the process, there's still some, there's still some injuries and there's still some limps. People get fired. It's a challenge. People get sick. People pass away. People are injured by one another. People find themselves making horrible choices. People allow their life to slip away. People lose passion. And that's a part of the real stories that we even read in the Bible. But if there's anything that, as I read the Bible, that I'm encouraged by is that God can still do something in imperfect people's lives. Some of the greatest people of the Bible make some of the most horrible decisions. And I kind of like, I, I feel like, okay, there's, there's some hope for Steve Parrish. Like, I, I wasn't born a preacher or behind a pulpit. I don't live standing here, okay? My life is less holy than this moment right now. And I, I have a real attitude. And when I drive down the freeway, I, I struggle, okay? Um, if I was the only driver in the world, it would be a perfect world because I'm a perfect driver in my mind. It's all the other people out there messing up the roadway. And I fight that in some and in other situations in life. I am definitely an imperfect people, but watching God work in the lives of imperfect people 
who want that perfecting process of God in their life is a wonderful thing. And I understand that your life comes with some of those same injuries, which cause limps to develop. And what I mean by that is, um, after meeting Shane, of course, one of my, not really a strategy, I just, I needed to get into the gym. And uh, he's got a gym and I need a gym. So, hey, that's a perfect fit, right? And so, as I began to work out and bulk up all natural, learning to food prep and all that kind of stuff, um, I noticed one day while I was doing some jumping jacks, that there was this weird feeling in this one knee. And so much so that I wasn't, I decided, "Ah, I don't want to go too far out there. And I noticed it for a few weeks. But then there was a day where I just worked out, didn't feel anything, worked out hard. And about 11 o'clock that morning, all of a sudden from the inside of my knee, there was this throb and this ache that just uh, began to spread out. There was no moment that I can point at of injury where I fell or something popped. But there was something that happened that now was very painful. And I went to the doctor and found that I had a torn meniscus. And they let me know at my decrepit old age, there was no sense of doing any surgery. So just rehab it, which means go to the gym and work out through the pain. And I found myself, though, limping because it it hurt. And this happened about a month and a half ago. And in my world, there was all sorts of stuff going on. And we were moving and we were doing stuff here at the church. And there was just no way to really protect my leg and just sit down. And so I found myself developing a limp to protect it. And last week, of all things, I noticed that I started to have some back pain. And I started realizing that I'm actually constantly limping. Even though I have rehabbed this leg, I've developed a less than best way of walking that's just been over time in response to an injury. And in an in a emotional, in a life experience much bigger and much uh, more impactful than that, I have found that in my life and in my story, there's been some injuries that have caused limps in my life. And I know your life is imperfect as well. I don't know what you've been through, but I wasn't born in the perfect family. My parents were young and not super responsible in their younger years or wonderful people now, but I grew up in environments where as a As a first grader, I came home to an empty house for four or five hours, and I have tried to light everything on the planet on fire and mix every concoction for my dogs and experience the the things that happen with neighbors who know that you're alone and all sorts of terrible things. And those things have actually marked my life, and they've caused me to actually limp because of what I've experienced. And that limp has actually, instead of steering me into the best things that God has has for me, and has destined me for, it's caused me to navigate away from those things because I'm constantly focusing on protecting injury that I've experienced. And I would say that's a pretty good summation for the stories in the Bible, people doing the things that they did because of things that happened to them and the limps that developed over time, right? And so one of the wonderful things I love about this process of God is God is looking to break in. He is looking to heal Uh, injury, and he's also looking to correct limps. Amen? I don't nearly need my life. Circumstances has changed as much in my life personally as I needed God to show up in my story and correct the injury and then rehabilitate the limps so that I can walk the path that he has for me. What I love about that process in my life is that there's no no amount of... of, uh, uh, training of myself that could have overcome those things. It's been a supernatural partnership where God has reached into my heart and he's changed things that I thought would never change, hatreds that he's removed, unforgiveness that he's helped me with, uh, desires that were were detrimental to my own own well-being that he's changed and it caused me to love things that are actually good for me and honorable in his sight. And I find myself involved with things that are so much healthier Because he reaches into the imperfect, he steps into our story, he helps us to shed the limp and gets us moving forward toward the better things that God has for us. I love that part of Shane's story where he says, I am still trying to figure this out. Welcome to the club, my friends. (laughs) I mean, we got a sense of direction, but man, what next step? It's a process. I also love, though, that I don't have to do it on my own, and it's not just me and God. It's me, it's God, it's my family, it's you, it's my church family, it's the people who will become a part of our family, navigating towards his best things. So with that, I want you to stand with me, and I want to pray for two things today specifically. 
I wanna pray for all of you. And I know that you guys are all in the process of my story. You have your story, it's going on. You are living your, my story. You, you get that? I've been involved with some of your story at different points. I, I won't forget the day when Joe Box, out of the military from Texas, coming to, I think it was Texas, wasn't it? It was too close enough. It, oh, no, it was uh, Mississippi. Yes, right there. And walked into our church family in the middle of his story. And actually a challenging chapter of his story. But to watch him walk into our family and make friends and become a part of family, to lean in, to step in, grab onto God and pursue after him. And it's been remarkable to watch what's transpired in Joe's life. And yeah, he's standing next to part of the story. You know, when, when you invite God into the story, the story actually begins to make some sense. You stop living the last chapter over and over. And you step into the new good things that he has. And you might step into it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit curvy, right? It might, it might be a straight shot. You might get to, oh, I think I can drive now. <laughs> yeah, okay. See, And then you're like, okay, Jesus, take the wheel. And I look around, again, around the room. I could name so many people in process as you stepped into the room. I think about Jalice. And, and we're, we're going to stick with Dustin, although some call him Justin. <laughs> they actually visited the church one day just to celebrate. I think it was Kim's birthday. And she's strategic. She's not going to let any event go by without using it as leverage to see people step into the house of God and experience who God is. With the hopes that while they're there, uh, that while they're there, while they're there, the heaven will open up and God will say, I love you, I want you, you're mine, let's go. The confidence to do that. And now we dream about the person that Jaleesa will bring in and that Dustin Justin will bring in <laughs> and the person that they'll influence. And wherever you are in your story, my hope is, is twofold, that number one, that you will position yourself so that you are behind, following in the story behind the one who gave his life for you. The one who Shane said yes to just this last year, the one who Kim said yes to years ago, but had needed to reaffirm that as she's gone along. The one that I said yes to in 1985, the one that maybe you're about to say yes to today to start that better story over your life. I wanna pray over each of your stories and I wanna pray for two specific things. Number one, I wanna pray for those of you in the room who in your story, Jesus stepped into the story, but somewhere in the story through the last few chapters, he's kind of MIA. You've, for whatever reason, you've just navigated because of circumstances, situations, people, you've kind of navigated away forgetting that he's the main player in the story. You're just the backup character. He's not a fixture added to the story. He is your story. And I want to invite you this morning to, to say, I'm gonna, things are going to be set straight before I walk out of this place. He is King and he is Lord. By the word of my mouth, the confession of my soul, he is first. And so you're going to make that decision today. And I'm also going to believe for the for some of you that have never, like me, for the first time, maybe you've gone to church for years, but you never saw the story being this, that it's actually, he's after you so that you can walk with him so that your story can now carry life with it. It can have purpose and direction, not survival life, but purpose on purpose life to be a part of his family, to be a part of a church family, to have an impact into a community, to fill the seat next to you with someone who someday you will stand in heaven with because of your mission in their life. That today, that if you've yet to say yes to Jesus, just like Shane in the living room, it was just so easy. I just looked at Shane, I said, hey, you ready to say yes? He's like, yeah, I'm ready to say yes. I said, good, let's say yes. And all he did, I said, pray with me. Jesus, I say yes. That's what he said. Jesus, I say yes. Amen. 
Now, the prayer after that's a little bit more complicated than that because it's learning to follow, learning to pray, learning to read the Bible. But starting the relationship is that easy. When I did their wedding, I didn't, it wasn't complicated. Do you? Yes, I do. Do you? Yes, I do. You are. Adios. Go off and live life. <laughs> Get everything you need, right? Starting a relationship with Jesus is the exact same simple manner. Say yes. So if you're either praying today to reestablish him as lordship, or you're inviting him into your life for the very first time, I just want you where you're standing to take your hand and I just want you to raise it. We're gonna pray over you. I'm not gonna make you come forward or anything, but today we're gonna to, together, we're gonna to reestablish his firstness in our lives. And for you, if you're saying yes for the very first time, I wanna invite you to do that. And as I pray, as we pray together, come that moment where I'll just invite you to say yes, okay? Father, and again, I'm sorry, it's a little creepy for some of you because you're used to closing your eyes, but I'm gonna look you in the eye when I pray for you. Father, I thank you for these wonderful people on this wonderful day. God, I'm grateful for them. I'm so thankful for our church family working so hard to create a box where family could happen. Father, I'm so honored that you would inhabit your people. If we gathered and you weren't here, uh, it'd be such a waste of time. There'd be some benefits, but we came to meet you, to see you, to walk with you. And you've come today, Lord. Lord, I'm so confident that you have made your presence known to each person in the room. And so Lord, today we make up our minds to reestablish you as first in the story. Lord, I thank you that you are Lord. I step back from the first position. I step back from living life for me, 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 me. And now I surrender my life fresh again to you and invite you to lead my life. Father, for some others here in this room, we're praying in response to the question, will you follow me? We're just saying, I just say yes. Come on, say that with me. If you're either praying that the first time or if you've already said yes, just say it with me. I say yes. Come on, one more time. I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. And some 30 plus years later, I still say yes. It's the one thing I was, one of a couple things I'll still say yes to. Still say yes to Rowan, and I'll still say yes to Jesus every single day. He's worth it, amen. Thanks for being with us today. Be sure to like and subscribe and visit us at c3swwa.com for more information about our church.